Well, Mark, could we just ask, ask everyone to mute themselves, please, before we start? Thank you. Are you recording now? I am. Excellent. Okay, folks. Uh, so here we are in the heart of the high territory now. Um, <clears throat> so what I want to do is turn our attention to the five layered cosmology as described by Baha'u'llah in the Tablet of All Food. And I sent you a copy of the provisional translation that Stephen Lambden, who is an eminent British scholar, Baha'i scholar, who is now living in California with his wife, Shole Quinn, who's also a renowned Baha'i scholar. Uh, he first provisionally translated this tablet in 1984. Since then, he's revised it in 1995, 2001, 2014, and finally in October of this year. So you have the latest version. Lambden recently delivered two Zoom seminars on this tablet that he obviously considers to be of great consequence. It's essential from the point of view of this course because in it, Baha'u'llah clarifies the Islamic model of the five divine presences that he had, we've been exploring for the last few weeks. Mujan Momin explains this cosmology in his seminal 2003 article called The God of Baha'u'llah, which appears in the Baha'i Faith in the World's Religions papers presented at the Irfan Colloquia. His article is based in part on an earlier essay he wrote in 1988 called Relativism, a basis for Baha'i metaphysics, which is found in studies in honor of Hassan M. Belayuzi. According to Momin, in the Tablet of All Food, Baha'u'llah is adapting a cosmology used by many philosophers and mystics in the Islamic world over the centuries. So if you'll just permit me, I'm going to switch to my readings. There they go. <clears throat> okay, so I see that Bob Andrighetti is here, so I was wondering if you could read number one for us, Bob. <clears throat> I think you're muted, uh, Bob. You're you're muted at the moment, Bob. There you go. All right there we go. Yeah. Reading number one. It is based on the Neoplatonic cosmology of such philosophers as Plotinus. It was also used extensively in Christian and Jewish philosophy and mysticism. Its Islamic development reached an apex in the writing of Avicenna during the 11th century, later was taken over by the philosopher mystics of the school of Isfahan, who expounded the divine philosophy in the 16th and 17th century. It was also used extensively by Sheikh Ahmed al ahtai the founder of the Sheikhi school, and by the Bab, a moment relativism or basis for Baha'i metaphysics. Okay. <clears throat> so Plotinus lived in Egypt from 205 to 270 in the common era. Uh, Avicenna or Ibn Sina, as he's known in Arabic, was a Persian who lived from 980 to 1037. Sheikh Ahmad lived from 1753 to 1826. And the Bob, as you all know, lived from October 20th, 1819 to July 9th, 1850. In section 79 of Gleanings, Baha'u'llah makes a noteworthy declaration. Uh, let me see here. Uh, how about you, Durham? Number two. As to thy question concerning the worlds of God, know thou of a truth that the worlds of God are countless in their number and infinite in their range. None can reckon or comprehend them except God, the all-knowing and the all-wise. Verily I say, the creation of God embraceth worlds besides this world and creatures apart from these creatures. 
In each of these worlds, he hath ordained things which none can search except himself, the all-searching, the all-wise. Leanings. So, <clears throat> apart from a few tantalizing comments regarding the nature of dreams, uh, Baha'u'llah does not explain these other worlds any further. To my knowledge, the only tablet in which he comments on the worlds of God in any detail is the tablet of all food. This tablet was revealed in Baghdad shortly before Baha'u'llah departed for Kurdistan on April the 10th, 1854, which I presume is why Durham's wearing a Sulaymaniyah hat tonight. <laughs> so that means that we can place this tablet in late 1853 or early 1854. It is the second major work of Baha'u'llah, the first being the poem Rashi Aman. The tablet is a commentary on verse 393 or 387 in some numbering systems of the Quran. Okay, so let's see. Um, how about you, Margaret? For number three, it's a short one, but it's important. All food was lawful unto the children of Israel, save what Israel had forbidden for himself before the Torah was sent down. Say, bring the Torah and recite it if you are truthful from the study Quran. Mm -hmm. Here's a quick question. Uh, who's Israel in this case? Jacob. Oh, you had to, you had to <laughs> give it away, Jack. <laughs> I was going to prolong this for three minutes. <laughs> okay, so Jacob had a wrestling match with an angel all night one night, ended up with a wounded thigh. Uh, but because he, I guess, endured that, he was given the name Israel by God. And that's where the term Israel the country and Israelites comes from that particular event. Now, Stephen Lambden went into great detail about this in his Zoom seminar. Uh, unfortunately, I didn't take notes of that at the time. So I realized today that I couldn't really explain very much about it. Uh, the, the two commentaries that uh, Lambden has on this particular tablet do not go into any detail about that issue, but he's uncovered all kinds of fascinating material from uh, from Judaism, Christianity, Islam, and Baha'i about that background. But unfortunately, we can't go there tonight. But hopefully he will create an article or, or a, a book about the subject that's fascinating to know the details. Okay, so Mirza Kamaluddin Naraki, who was a Babi who had met the Bob in Kashan, requested this commentary from from Baha'u'llah while he was residing in Baghdad. Naraki had earlier sought a commentary on this Quranic verse from Mirza Yahya, but was so disappointed with the response that he turned to Baha'u'llah for a more satisfactory answer. In the Tablet of All Food, Baha'u'llah provides a multi-level exegesis explaining the, multi er, the mystical significance of the word food in the Quranic passage. As we saw in my previous course on Abdu'l Baha as an interpreter, and we'll see again next week, Abdu'l Baha adopted a similar multi leveled structure for his commentary on the Surah of Rum. Okay, let's see who else can read here. How about Leslie Cole for number four? Baha'u'llah explained that this verse, Quran 393, in the spiritual worlds of God has infinite meanings, most of which are beyond the comprehension of man, and that he could, through his all-encompassing knowledge, continue to reveal them for many years. But he elucidated some of these, including the spiritual meaning of food, and in doing so, unveiled in an infinitesimal measure of the glory, the mystery, and the vastness of the spiritual worlds of God 
which are without limit and far beyond the understanding of man hmm. or men. <laughs> so here, here's a yet another case where Baha'u'llah is suggesting how much there is to the divine knowledge that he has access to that he, he felt we probably wouldn't understand. So he's not bothering to share it with us at this point. So that's, I think, tantalizing in itself. I mean, what else is he going to share at some point or the next manifestation? What will they share that we don't know yet? Uh, so, as I said, we do not ha yet have an authorized English translation of this tablet. So that means we have to rely on Stephen Lambden's provisional translation, which he refers to as a rough draft to get a sense of its wondrous contents. The following passage is from Baha'u'llah's introduction. Okay, this is uh, maybe Der David Erickson could read this next one. The numbers I have inserted in order to make it clear which, uh, which of the uh, lines is being referred to here. Can you unmute, uh, David? There we go. Sorry about that. That's okay. O oh, thou glorious inquirer, who art set at glow through the fire of the friend, be thou assured that from the very first day that God aided me through faith in him and confirmation in his cause, it was not my desire to respond to the inquiries of any amongst the servants. Uh, but since I found in thy heart a fire from the proof of God and a brand from the light of the manifestation of his self, the ocean of my affection has surged, and it is my wish to reply to thee through the power and might of God. My munificence overflows with the sprinklings of servitude in the land of theophany, in order that the breezes of light might attract thee unto the summit of exhilaration, and cause thee to attain that station which God hath decreed for thee in these days in which the winds of sorrow have encompassed me on all sides. This on account of that which the hands of the people have committed, for they have calumniated me without proof or without test uh, or written testimony. O oh Lord, cast patience upon me and make me to be victorious over the seditious people. Hmm. Wow. Yeah. So before we go on, let's find out what calumny is. Um, let me see who's here. Okay, Belinda, why don't you take it? Just do this Oops. next uh, calumny and calumny. I'll have to ask them to unmute. It. There we go. Thanks. Oh, no. <laughs> yeah, okay. Okay. Unmuted. Okay. These are words that turn up in some of the prayers. Yeah. Calumny often mispronounced, I must say, false and malicious misrepresentation of the words or actions of others, calculated to injure their reputation, libellous and this detraction and slander. Um, so, so some of this stuff could be illegal. Um, calumniate, to asperse with calum calumny, utter calumny regarding to accuse or charge falsely and maliciously with something criminal or disreputable to slander. Mm -hmm. um, some of this stuff could run into the realm of um, criminal behavior even. Uh, it would nowadays, yeah. Mm -hmm. Well, that's libelous detraction. Yeah, libelous. Slander. Yeah, yeah, so pretty heavy stuff. That's what is happening to Baha'u'llah just before he leaves for two years. It's backbiting taken to a high level. Yeah. yeah that's a good way of looking at it. Um, so from this introductory statement, it is clear that this was the very first time Baha'u'llah had agreed to respond to someone's questions in writing. In his notes for a Wilmet course on this tablet, Muin Afnan suggests that it may well be the first tablet Baha'u'llah ever revealed in Baghdad. 
Now that's number seven. Okay, so. Okay, so what we're doing now is we're continuing on with uh, a different section of this tablet. It's in section eight, lines one to two, and then the first line of section nine. It's a little bit, well, fortunately you have the tablet so you can access exactly the section that I'm talking about here. Um, okay, so let's see who's, who's available here. Okay, Alan Fuller, how about you? Sure. Um, then know that for this paradisical verse, this choice verse, divine song and heavenly pearl are subtle meanings, endless in their infinitude. I, by the grace and bounty of God, shall sprinkle upon thee something of this the superabundance of its meanings that may serve as a memorial for the believers, a guiding light for the estranged, and a stronghold for the agitated. Then bear thou witness that for food, lilatam, lilataman, are diverse levels of meanings. It must suffice thee, however, that we expound four of them. This is for Baha'u'llah from the Tablet of Food. Mm -hmm. Okay. So in the tablet, in sections 11 through 13, Baha'u'llah provides five separate ways in which to understand this Quranic verse. Here is how Lambden identifies these five levels of meaning presented within the tablet in his Wilmat Institute notes. Okay, is Carol on tonight, Carol Ravel? Uh, Carol's not with us yet. Okay, how about Lori then? Okay. Number eight. The mystical signif significance of food is related to a hierarchy of paradises and metaphysical realms well known in the theophysical Sufism those of Hahut. Lahut, Jabarut. You might want to actually read the, the uh, English translations there. Okay. So with... ha Hahut, the realm of the divine Ipicity. Ipsaity. Ipsaity, Lahut, uh -huh. the realm of the divine Theophany. Jabarut, the realm of the divine decrees, spiritual powers. Malakut, the heavenly kingdom or realm of angels. And Nas Nasut, the realm of creation. Okay. Five levels. Now, we saw those in a chart form, I believe, last week, right? Mm -hmm. And we'd seen something quite similar in Ibn Arabi. And as Momin had said earlier, this is all, uh, an, a set of ideas that has a very long history. So we're not coming at it brand new, but what will be new is Baha'u'llah's take on it, because now you're getting the authorized truth. Okay, so in 1992, Ottawa's own resident scholar, Jack McLean, wrote a 42 page article for the Journal of Baha'i Studies, which appeared in the volume five, number one issue. He called it Prolegomenon to a Baha'i Theology. And I do happen to have that right here. Just hang on a second. Oh, where did I put it? Oh, for crying out loud. What? Okay. So put yourself on mute, sweetie. If <laughs> you're going to get frustrated. Now, can you see that? <laughs> Are you able to see that, Linda? Yeah. Okay. Can everyone so this else? Is yeah. A lengthy article. Um, fascinating topic, still quite relevant. Um, <clears throat> but I'm not going to go through the content of it. But I wanted you to have it for reference in case you'd like to follow it up. Because the chart we're going to focus on comes from this document. Okay. Let me see where we are. Back here. Okay. 
So let's, um, uh, it's such a short one. I'll read this number nine. A prolegomena is a preliminary discourse prefaced to a literary work or an introductory or preliminary observations on the subject of a book. So Jack is just opening up this subject of there being a Baha'i theology. And there's been pushback, hasn't there, Jack? Uh, some people were very uncomfortable with using the term theology, but it's the study of God. That's really all it is. But of course, it's got a history with Christianity uh, that many people would like to forget. They don't want to taint the Baha'i studies field with that, that word, unfortunately. So maybe you could say something about that, Jack. Or where are things at in your sense now? Is, has it... Well, there, you know, there was, people were uncomfortable with the term because you know, when I was growing up, uh, I used to hear this term man-made theologies, you know, and Christianity, and was always used in a derogatory way. But as you've pointed out, Mark, theology just means the study of things divine. And actually, the Universal House of Justice in the 1980s, um, answering the NSA of Germany, uh, Udo Schaefer, I believe, was on the NSA at that time, said that the term was correct, provided, you know, they defined it in, in a very simple way. But the problem with the, the term theology is, as you said, Mark, it has such a divisive history of sectarianism in the past. So it has a lot of unpleasant baggage. Uh, some people like the term divine philosophy instead, but what is divine philosophy if it isn't theology? It's the same thing. So I don't know what else to call it. Something like the unity of the world's religions or even the topic that you're considering tonight, Mark, or progressive revelation. This is theology. What else is it? Um, Anyway, the Wilmot Institute now actually offers courses in Baha'i theology. So I think the, the word has gained some acceptance, although some people are still uncomfortable with it because usually in the past it was clerics who defined theological dogmas and we don't have clerics. So, so that, can you speak of a Baha'i theologian <laughs> like it, it gets complicated. I, I would never call myself a Baha'i theologian. I might say I'm a religion scholar of religion or something like that, because it might suggest that somebody's, uh, you know, defining something in a, in a sort of an authoritative way. But I, I, I think it's okay to, to use it and to talk about it, provide we understand what, what we're talking about, you know? Okay. Anybody have any questions or comments about that issue? Okay. Um, so Jack argues for the validity of a Baha'i theology based on an understanding of the metaphysical reality and teachings of the divine manifestations, which is why you could say that it's about progressive revelation. Uh, to illustrate the role played by the manifestations of God, he created a valuable diagram of the five realms of being articulated by Baha'u'llah, which I will just show you presently here. And it's right here. Okay. I've had occasion to use this about four or five different classes over the years. So I have to uh, say yet again how wonderful I think it is. It's a a beautiful diagram of the worlds of God. So now let's examine each of these five worlds of God in descending order. So we'll start with up at the top here, Hahut. So I'll be closing this diagram. I, I sent this to you. I hope you have access to it or you printed it so that you can follow along as we continue. It will make life a little easier, I think. Uh, let's see now. Okay, so we're going to talk about Hahut. 
So although there are five worlds in the traditional cosmology, it is apparent from Baha'u'llah's description that there is a higher world that cannot properly be confined within any system of classification. Here is how Baha'u'llah describes the meaning of food in the realm of Hahut, the realm of he. So gird your loins, this is gonna be tough material because this just because of the subject matter. Okay, Heather Harvey, how would you like to uh, take this on? It signifies the realm of the throne of Henus, the paradise of the exclusive divine oneness. None is capable of expounding even a letter of that verse relative to that paradise. Uh, this in as much as the, that realm is that of the mystery of endless duration, the I-ness of the exclusive divine singularity, the incomparable Israelicity and the resplendent selfhood. Its exoteric aspect is the essence of, es of its esoteric aspect and its esoteric aspect, the essence of its es exoteric aspect. It is inappropriate that anyone should attempt to elucidate a single letter of it. God, however, will disclose its mysteries when he willeth unto whomsoever he willeth. And I, verily, in view of my injury and my misery, am not informed of even a letter thereof. Then it, this, inasmuch as the matter cannot be related except on the part of God, its fashioner and its originator. Baha'u'llah. Oh boy. Thank you. So, this is a realm that even Baha'u'llah doesn't know anything about. So, we're going to have a hard time doing anything with this at all except noting it and moving on. Because there's, it's just too exalted for us to begin to grapple with. Hahut is an Arabic word formed according to the same Syriac pattern as more familiar words such as Nasut, which means humanity. According to Juan Cole, it probably derives from the letter, the Arabic letter Ha, which stands for huia, or God's self-identity. But listen to how Momen portrays this indescribable realm. Uh, Ingrid, how about you for number 11? Mm -hmm. The locus of the unseen and unknown essence of God is, in some places in the writings of Baha'u'llah, stated to be the realm of Hahut. This realm is barred to human understanding, and so no descriptions of God can be given here. God, in, God is in this realm only known by such negative phrases as the hidden treasure and the absolute unknown. The only affirmation that can be made of God in this realm is he or it. In other words, that no sentence can be constructed about this level of reality. As soon as one starts to construct a sentence of description, he or it is, one has revealed one's ignorance. In this realm, the names and attributes are unmanifested and so only exist in potential form. Even the term oneness cannot be attributed to God in this stage. Only a unitary concept, the primal oneness, can be said to subsist here. That's Mujan Momen. Thank you. So this uh, comes back to the concept I think we touched on in the course on Abu Baha about the difference between um, Ahadiya and Wahadiya. So Hahut exists at Ahadiya, in which the oneness has not um, progressed to the point where there's any level of manifestation whatsoever. 
everything is unmanifest. Wahadiya is a second stage, which we'll come to in a moment, uh, where all the names and attributes of God are unmanifested, but they're starting to not separate, but be distinguishable, I guess is what you could say. Still extremely rarefied, but that's what they're telling us is happening in the world. Uh, so Hahut is the realm of the unknowable essence of God, the hidden treasure, the realm of he, the paradise of absolute oneness, Ahadiyah. And this is the unmanifest face of God. Okay, so let's see what Mark, the Mark, uh, Bob has his hand up. Oh, Bob, yes, please, getting... go ahead. Go ahead, Bob. Oops, sorry. Yeah. There my, we go. Uh, my computer is a bit slow. Uh, Mark, I've been fascinated with that uh, word, hahut, because as I mentioned, I've been uh, kind of dabbling in Arabic over the last few years, and perhaps some of the friends here that are more familiar with Arabic can shed some light on it. But depending on how hoot is spelled, it can actually mean ocean in the sense of muhayt, or it can mean a fish, like a whale. Like the whale that swallowed Jonah was a hoot. So I always thought there was a there was a poetic link there between the fact that the unapproachable oneness and selfness of God can also be understood either as an ocean, depending on whether you spell it with a with a ha, or sorry, whether you put a put a t. There's different kinds of uh, characters that represent the sound t. So if you put it with one it becomes ocean or a type of ocean or surrounding. And if you put it with the other kind of tea, it becomes um, a fish or a whale. As a matter of fact, the constellation Pisces in the sky in Arabic is called al mm -hmm. So, you know, another sense of the transcendence. Hmm. Well, I'm going to defer to the Arabic speaking people in the audience, Nina and Durham. What, uh, what can, light can you shed on that? I never heard it as an ocean or as a fish, but maybe I am wrong. So Darham would clarify it. Well, hoot in Arabic, it's written with ha. Yeah. Not the ha. See, when you say ha, that means the fish or whale. But in Arabic, in philosophy, in Sufism, they write it with the ha. It's the same like from Baha'u'llah, you know, the letter of Baha'u'llah, ha, huwa, huwa Allah. So ha, hoot. So it's, this is my understanding. It's only one T at the end, not more than T. That's okay. right. Yeah. So, so there are two H's in Arabic, right? Yes. Is that is that what you're trying to to tell us? I mean, our ears are not attuned to the difference. Yes, in in English, when you say hoot, hoot means well, well. Right. Gotcha. That's the difference. It's like, uh, you know, Haider Ali. You know, Mullah Haider Ali yeah. starts with H, which is also H, but it's not like who Allah. So it, this uh, who it will be. It is two. It is two different alphabets in Arabic. Right. There is a ha and a ha. So, so one when softer. You say, when you right? say ha, it's from your throat. So there are two completely different alphabets. Yeah. But it's difficult for English-speaking people to pick up that difference, unfortunately. That's right, because it is an H in Arabic in English. Sorry, yeah. Oh, Bob, I don't know if that answers your question, but I, I guess it's the wrong H when we're talking about the whale. That's right. Oh, uh, what can I say? 
but I mean, certainly there's an ocean idea, but even that's, that's too much of a manifestation for Hahu. Right, that's limiting. If you see what I'm saying. And Mujai Momin would not agree with any, any descriptor whatsoever of Hahu. No matter how comprehensive it is, it doesn't matter. It's still limited. So. Oh, Mark. Yes. Um, yeah, you know, there's a lot of names for this level of existence and, and you gave us some of them on your chart called synonyms for the divine, five uh, divine presidents, presences. Yes. So we can't talk about it. And yet we have lots of terms that point to it. <laughs> yeah. um, including you put here some ones from other traditions like absolute reality, cloud of unknowing, Brahman, Nirvana, Dharmakaya, Dharmakaya, excuse me, and the Tao. And you know, the, I think all that is extremely significant because it puts us uh, able to talk with other other traditions. Mm -hmm. In fact, this is all a prolegomena to a future Baha'i metaphysic of world religions. Uh, in other words, these these levels have different names in different traditions, and if that's pointed out, it, it sets up dialogue potential between the different faiths. Anyway, I, I just thought I would throw that out. So on one hand, we can't say a thing about it. On the other hand, it's got about 30 or 40 different names, maybe 50 or 60 if you count other faiths, throw them in there. Yeah. You, you're perceiving where I'm heading for sure. That's exactly okay. right. Yeah. Okay, well, let's not labor that any further. Um, let me see here. Did we do number 12? I don't think so. Sorry, I got kind of sidetracked here. Um, I see Carolyn is on tonight. How about uh, reading 12 for us? Um, before I do that, uh, Mark, um, uh, referring to Bob's um, wonderful thesis, he's taken up from the wellspring of guidance, the fact that in past dispensations, so many errors have arisen because people wanted to um, encompass the divine message within the framework of their own very limited understanding. And um, they defined all the doctrines where their definition was beyond um, their own power. And I think this is what we're getting at here because um, theology has to always be, as he says, subordinate to the revelation whose purpose it is to elucidate. <laughs> and mm. I think that hits the nail on the head. Okay, number 12. <clears throat> That's a good comment. Thank you. Um, in this station, all the names and attributes of God are undifferentiated and inseparable from the essence. Yeah. Abdu'l-Baha likens this to a dot of ink on paper within which are hidden and enclosed all letters and words in potential form. Although no trace can be seen of these, nor are they in any way differentiated from the dot in this state of potentiality. Watch a moment, revolution mm -hmm. That's a nice analogy for us. Mm -hmm. So this realm is forever beyond the rest of creation. Even the manifestations of God have no access to this station. This world, if you can even use that word, uh, includes the first stage of creation, which arises out of God's love. Okay, that's number 13. And let's see if we have Bill Kelly, maybe. <clears throat> According to Abdul Baha, in his commentary on the Islamic tradition, I was a hidden treasure. The first stirrings of the coming into existence of the phenomenal world occur through a movement of love within the hidden treasure, for love necessitates an object that is loved. The movement within the hidden treasure takes the form of love for, for and knowledge of its beauty reflected in the eternal arch, archetypal forms all of, create, of all created things. This is the stage reflected in the first phrase of the Islamic tradition, I was a hidden treasure and desired, loved to be known. 
It is also the first phase of the hidden word of Baha'u'llah. I love thy creation, hence created thee. Mm -hmm. Okay, so that's uh, just about as much as we can say about that first level, if it's even a level. You might even want to think of it as the paper on which all the other levels are written. It's, uh, it encompasses them all and transcends them all. So now let's go to the level of Lahut, which is the sphere of the divine. So let's see what Baha'u'llah says about food in the second highest world of God, the realm of Lahut or divinity. So maybe Sherry can read this next one. Number 14. <coughs> Excuse me. It signifieth the realm of the paradise of endless duration, the throne of the divine realm, the snow white light. It is the station of he is he himself, and there is none other save him. This paradise is allotted unto those servants who are established upon the seat of glory who quaff liquid camphor nigh unto the all-beauteous one, and who recite the verses of light in the heaven of manifest justice. Thereby are they enraptured, and from that food derive comfort. Hmm. So this is the realm of God revealed, or God manifest. Here's moments explanation of Lahu. That's number 15. So how about Bob LeBlanc for this one? <clears throat> okay, uh, number 15. The first emanation from the unseen and unknown Godhead is the primal will, mashiat e awal This is the beginning of the realm of Lahut the realm in which the potentialities within the divine essence appear. It is the realm of he is, he is he, and there is none but he. In other words, the only descriptions of reality at this level that are valid refer back to this level. It cannot be likened to anything that is below it. Mark, uh, could I ask you, these things have always puzzled me. Now, is this one will or is this where the manifestations have individual realities or are they all, <laughs> You'll see. Are they all one big reality here in the <laughs> Mashiati Awal? Do you have any idea about that? Well, pretty, pretty obscure. We're, we're going to come, come to that when we talk about the third level, oh. which is Jabrut, where the manifestations of God take on individual characteristics. Okay. But in so this, this is... level, they are all one, okay. uh, indistinguishable from each other. Okay, so this is the oneness of the... Of the manifestations. Of the manifestations. Okay, thank you. And the primal will, as you know, is the... Uh, the entity that gives birth to, or that creates everything else, right down to the stones and all, all the rest. Okay. So Lahut is the first revelation of the essence of God. Now notice the moment says that it emanates from Hahut. It is not manifested by the unknowable God. This is a critical distinction. This echoes Abdu'l Baha's criticism of some of the Sufis who misunderstood the mechanics of creation. Sufis commonly understood things as manifestations of the divine essence. Using the metaphors of the sea taking on the form of waves or ink the form of letters as analogies of the relationship between the essence of God and the fixed archetypes in the mind of God. But according to Abdu'l Baha, beings emanate from God. They are manifested by God. Sorry, I should have written here, they are manifested by the primal will. I don't know why I said that. I lost my concentration. 
Okay, so number 16, um, how about Joey? I'll just move this up so it's a bit more visible. There you go. The Sufis maintain that the realities of all things are the manifestation of the one, whereas the prophets say that they emanate therefrom. A great and great indeed is the difference between manifestation and emanation. Appearance through manifestation means that a single thing becomes manifest in infinite forms. For example, when the seed, which is a single thing endowed with the perfections of the vegetable kingdom, manifests itself, it becomes resolved into, into the infinite forms of the branches, leaves, flowers, and fruit. This is called manifestational appearance. Whereas in appearance through emanation of the one remains transcendent in its heights of sanctity. But the existence of creatures is obtained from it through emanation, not manifestation. It can be cared, compared to the sun. The rays emanate from it and shine forth upon, upon all things. But the sun remains transcendent in, its, in the heights of its sanctity. It does not descend. It does not resolve itself into the forms of the rays. It does not appear in the identity of things through specification or individualization. The pre-existent does not become the originated. Absolute wealth does not fall captive to poverty. Unqualified perfection is not transformed into utter perfect imperfection. Dr. Baha, some answer questions. So I think one of the things that strikes me is that the Bab, Baha'u'llah, and Abdu'l Baha all feel it's important to focus on this issue. They have made a great deal of, of it. And the only reason I can think of is that Islam screwed up badly. When, I mean, it, it promotes itself as believing in the oneness of God. And yet this idea that is being criticized here undermined their sense of the purity of the oneness of God. They didn't understand how transcendent the essence of God is. And so as you read the writings, you'll, you'll find lots and lots of references to this subject in all three of those writings. So it's key that you remember that it's all about emanation. And the, the idea of the manifestation, of course, was uh, picked up on in Islam. And uh, Chris, Christianity was, was targeted because it promoted the idea that the unknown God could manifest in Christ. And that was uh, considered to be a big no-no. And yet they went ahead and <laughs> still didn't get the idea clear. So here we are hearing the truth one more time in crystal clear language. And hopefully we get it this time. That when we're talking about a creator, we're always talking about the primal will. We're not talking about the essence of God. Okay, that's a good place for a break for a minute to, uh, I wanna see who's 